Good afternoon. I want to um, start off first by wishing, on behalf of myself and the Houston Police Department, our condolences to the five victims of this shooting incident, especially to the family of uh, Mr. Eugene Linsko. Um, but we are here to present the facts as we know them now uh, in, in regards to the shooting that occurred this Sunday. I want to stress that this investigation is still evolving. We have plenty of witnesses that we still need to interview. We have plenty of evidence that still needs to be processed. So with that information, um, before I bring the investigators up, I want to just to publicly recognize some individuals that I believe are heroes. Uh, they asked that I not identify them, but these individuals um, were able to see the incident as it was unfolding, and they were able to see the uh, shooter from their home. They had the uh, whereabouts about them to immediately notify the police that were in the area. Who, once they went in their home and ascertained where the shooter was, this officer was able to immediately bring in a squad officer <coughs> who, as we all know, was able to terminate the shooting incident. But my hat goes out to these individuals because they made the decision to alert the police as to what was occurring, opened up their homes uh, to allow us to do what we had to do. Um, but in my mind, they are heroes, and they diverted what I believe could have been more casualties. So with that said, I wanted to turn it over now to uh, Lieutenant John McGallan. Good afternoon. The information I'm going to give you is what we know at this point. There are going to be some questions that I will not be able to answer. Um, what we do know at this point is that our suspect <clears throat> came from California. He drove in on Wednesday, arrived on Saturday. Um, went to see some friends here. We don't know exactly why he picked the location that he picked. It seems to be random. Uh, it wasn't a targeted location. We believe he picked it for its tactical uh, advantages it had over other areas. The suspect um, deliberately went off the radar probably around 4 o'clock. Friends and family were unable to contact him. We believe at that point in time he broke into the tire shop and was staying there. On Sunday, um, some people that run a car wash business were outside washing cars. The suspect came out of the location. Uh, the people that were washing cars didn't know anybody was in there. Nobody was supposed to be in there. He came out, confronted uh, Mr. Linscombe, and shot him once in the neck. Our witnesses ran away for safety. Our suspect then went back into the tire shop, retrieved an AR-15 assault rifle, came out and began shooting at passing cars. Um, he shot at arriving police officers. He struck two police officers. He struck several police vehicles. <coughs> As he was shooting, he struck a line to a gas station next to the tire shop, caught it on fire. Um, SWAT began to arrive on the scene, set up a perimeter, and the threat was eliminated. When the shooting first started, there was a gentleman named John Wilson who came out to the scene, who we believed initially could have been a secondary shooter or be involved in this incident somehow. Uh, through the course of our investigation, we were able to eliminate him as a suspect. He's a resident in the area who came out to offer assistance um, and got outgunned and realized he was in a bad situation, tried to leave, and was shot in the leg by the suspect as he was trying to get to safety. Um, since that time, we've been able to identify our suspect and do some background investigation on him. He is prior military um, from California, was discharged in 2013, uh, has had various jobs, and has been suffering from 
some depression, I guess you could say. His family indicated that he uh, wasn't feeling right, and he left to come here to hang out with his friends and try to find work here. Um, at the scene, um, we found some some random writings on the walls he wrote on paper. Uh, nothing of consequence. There doesn't appear to be any kind of a terrorism link to this or anything like that. It just appears to be someone who was in mental health crisis at this point in time. Um, we've spoken to all the witnesses that we can locate. I'm sure other witnesses are going to come forward. We've spoken to everyone who was shot um, that we know of. If there's any other victims, we ask that they come forward. If you have information, please come forward. Um, and I think that's all we have at this point in time. Is there anything that I missed? Any uh, questions for either the lieutenant or the chief? Could you talk about the backpack? Uh, it was, it's, it's a crucial piece of evidence that was seemingly left behind there at the scene. Why, why and how? Much? Chief, do you want to take that one? The backpack was, um, was part of the investigation, and it was a control detonation that occurred with that backpack. So we, uh, in essence, blew it up. It should have been collected. Uh, it was not. There was an assumption made by uh, two different units that the other was going to take care of that. Obviously, that will not occur again. It was a residence in the area that uh, had a direct line of sight <coughs> to the business, and we were able to uh, have concealment and cover from that location so that we could set up our s snipers and our SWAT team could uh, eliminate the suspect as soon as they could. And can you characterize the type of, sh of, the type of uh, uh, shot that was, was this a, a long shot? Was this a I'm not going to. I'm not going to get into specifics. I don't want to be able to locate where these individuals lived. They've asked to be anonymous, and I'm going to respect that. Well, I mean, just. I mean, just in terms of the type of, of shot that this officer needed to be to make this kind of this kind of hit. Over a hundred. Over a hundred yards. Did you believe he was helped or assisted by anyone in the Houston area? He said he came here to see friends. Did he actually meet with people here in Houston before before this happened? We have no indication that he had any help from anybody in Houston at all. Did he actually meet with people, though, beforehand? I'm not going to get into who he met with or what he did beforehand, but I can tell you that nobody in Houston that we know of was involved in this in any way. Can you speak to discussion in the neighborhood that perhaps this was a hate crime somebody targeted because they were Jewish or any connection that there might have been between the shooter and the initial victim? There was no indication that this was a hate crime. There's also no indication at this point in time that the individual was uh, targeted. It just seems to be a random act at this point. Were you able to find if he had been medically diagnosed with anything, any doctors, or it was just depression from his parents? We haven't been able to verify that through any kind of medical records yet. We're dealing with the military. Uh, we haven't been able to find out whether he was seeking professional help or not. This person you mentioned, John Wilson, who, I guess, did, he, did he engage with the, the, the suspect? Or what, or the only the, the only engagement he had with the suspect is when the suspect shot him. So he was did you, did you say he was trying out to, trying to help, or, or what was he doing out there? He was coming out to try to help the police department and didn't think very wisely and made a bad choice and got himself in a bad situation. But he wasn't armed himself? He wasn't armed? Was he armed? Or? Yes, he was armed. But just to be clear, he never got a chance to fire off? That is correct. Did he say anything to the suspect? No, he did not. Just showed up. Witnesses we've talked to at that car wash, and I'm sure you guys have talked to them as well, said that they heard him, that they heard the suspect shouting slurs about Jews and gays and sinners. Are you guys hearing that as well? And I'm not going to get into the specifics of what our witnesses told us. If they told you something, then that's going to be what they have to say. At this point in time, we're not going to release any of that. But you're confident that there is no hate crime element to this at all? No. Can you elaborate on the writings that no, I prefer not to at this point in time. Was the suspect seen in that area prior <coughs> to the shooting? No, uh, he was not seen in the area. We had uh, some people that saw 
you know, obviously people washing cars, but no one, no one saw him in the area. We heard reports that he might have been staking out the, that area for Sunday. No, I don't, I don't believe staking out's the, the proper term. I think he broke into the business on Saturday and stayed in there overnight is what we're assuming happened. And on Sunday he was, uh, he woke up and did what he did. Is it John Wilson or Byron Wilson? We have John Wilson. John Wilson. Is it your sense that the guns were, that you obtained were obtained legally? That's, we're still under investigation at this point in time. Did you recover his vehicle as well? We did. Was there anything inside, any evidence, any insight? We collected everything that was inside. At this point in time, we're processing it, and I prefer not to get into what exactly we found inside of his vehicle. Can you describe the kind of car it was? It was a white vehicle with California license plates on it. Were the weapons legally obtained by uh, him? As I stated to him, I do not know. That's still under investigation. Do you know how many rounds were shot during the whole ordeal? That's an excellent question. Our suspect shot 212 rounds. Met everybody collectively, 212 rounds. And you guys just one shot, is that right? Police discharged their weapon once? Four shots from the same shooter, one sniper. Some residents were telling me that they saw a suspicious black truck in the neighborhood. Is there a black truck of any kind that's been uh, part of your investigation that you might have noticed? Absolutely not. Chief, I want to direct this question to you. You talked about the uh, assumption that was made about the backpack being collected and that it shouldn't have happened. What's going to happen to those, the officers in those two units who were involved in trying to get that backpack? Well, first of all, I need to find out exactly why. We detonated it. We destroyed it. But it should have been collected as evidence. Um, and then just find out what, what happened, why it was left behind. It could have been human error. Regardless, uh, it doesn't need to occur. He was in phone communication with his friends and family up until 4 o'clock. It's our belief he had the ability to charge his phone so it wasn't that his phone was dead. We think he took active steps to avoid being contacted. And in your mind, that's just turning off the phone? Is that what? Yeah. Is it up until 4 o'clock? I'm sorry. Uh, is that Saturday? Or Saturday. Saturday. Is that 4, 4, 4 p.m. Saturday? Or yes. Okay. Had he been living at home with his mom? Uh, I do not know that. Had he been living at home? With his sister. With his sister in California. In Rancho Cucamonga? Yes. How do you say his name? Dionisio Garza. Lieutenant, you mentioned um, what John Wilson did was a, a bad decision. Would you elaborate on what you would like citizens to do in those situations? Uh, yes. Uh, much like the citizens that called us that allowed us access to their home to eliminate this problem, uh, shelter in place, particularly when we make the announcement to shelter in place, there's a reason. Um, at this point in time, he could have been, it could have been much, much worse for Mr. Wilson. He put himself in a, in a bad situation. Staying inside and staying safe would have been the prudent thing to do, and that's what we recommend citizens do in something like this, is to stay inside. What, what he did was very, very brave. But, but the officers are trained in these type of active shooter situations. And obviously, he wasn't able to engage. He was um, outgunned and probably outmaneuvered and out as far as his tactical training wasn't at the same speed as, this, as, as our uh, suspect. It's just call the police and let us do what, we're, what we have to do uh, and not put yourself in a situation where you become a victim. I'm not an expert, but obviously a lot of skill. But um, it did not um, penetrate the engine or anything critical. So they were able to get to safety. They were able to pull away and get to safety. They knew that they were under fire at the time? 
Uh, it's, there's confusion over that in terms of whether they knew or didn't know, but they knew enough to pull. They heard something that they pulled away. I believe our I believe our public information officer recommended <laughs> that everyone stay inside. I believe it was a shelter in place that was put out. City of Houston. Did City of Houston did it. They did it to Twitter, Instagram, and, and yes. social media. Alert, so, alert Houston from the City of Houston. And I think we also used the media that was, mm -hmm. was around. So neighbors also look on websites. Call. Did you elaborate? You said you blew up the backpack. We had, we did a controlled detonation on the backpack. Uh, our bomb squad came out and analyzed it and saw some items in there that they were concerned about. Um, the choice and the decision was made to do a controlled detonation to render that object safe. Um, once we did render it safe, um, we realized that it was not anything sinister and we went on with, about our search and conducting our investigation. I'm not going to get into how we identified the shooter. So I saw ammo in that bag. Can you give us a sense of how much extra ammo he wasn't able to fire off because your officer took your SWAT team member took that action? I'm not going to get into how much ammunition he had in the vehicle, but it's, it suffices to say after he fired 212 rounds, he was he was prepared. You mentioned earlier that you, at this point you don't really know why you picked that specific location. We just have a, a technical advantage of the Right. I, we believe that due to his military training and the location, he was able to um, feel safe in that location. He had access to three corners. He was backed up against a fence, so he didn't have to worry about anybody coming in behind him. Um, it was just a location that he felt safe doing this in. And that's the only thing we can surmise at this point in time until something different comes along. That's what we're going to have to go with as far as why he chose that location. There seems to be no rhyme or reason to it. All 212 rounds fired from that one, the AR-15, you said? AR-15. There was only one weapon recovered capable of shooting that round at the scene. Okay. But we recovered two. But we recovered two, a pistol and a rifle. Okay. So all 212 were clearly from the rifle. That's correct. Okay. Lieutenant, could you do a little recap how it started and how long it took for the SWAT member to subdue the subject? Yep. We got our initial call at 10-15 regarding an active shooter. Our officers were dispatched at, seven, at 10 17. They arrived five minutes later. Um, at 11 10, the, uh, the threat was eliminated. Uh, we've reached out to everyone that we can think of to reach out to to obtain information. Everyone's been extremely cooperative. Again, have given us any assistance we've needed. Do you know whether he was discharged from the army dishonorably, honorably? Do you have any details on this history there? I do not have any details at this point in time on that. Any yeah. other questions from the lieutenant or the chief? How concerned are you about this type of incident? Well, one of the things that we can do is remain vigilant with our returning veterans and being mindful of the stuff that they've been through and the things that they're having to deal with. One of the particular dangers that we deal with in law enforcement as it relates to uh, individuals that come back from the military um, is they're highly trained. They come with a very specific skill set. When you have incidents like this, it becomes very dangerous for us. But at the same time, we have to be mindful of the fact that most veterans that come back would never do anything like this. Um, but there's some people that go into 
mental health crisis that we have to deal with, and it's extremely dangerous to deal with. If I would remind everybody that these kind of incidents go across the country. It's not just in Houston. And we have a video, the city has a video out, which is run, hide, uh, and fight. And as the lieutenant stated, you have to be vigilant. These things do occur. And, and follow the tips that we're giving you. Run, hide, and fight only as a last resort when you don't have another choice. Thank and, you, Chief. And just, I'm very proud of these officers. We had a lot of help from DPS. We, we had Precinct 5 out there. In my uh, 36 years, they did an outstanding job in terms of securing the perimeter, making sure people were out of harm's way, and protecting folks. I, I think um, I'm very proud of my people. Thank you. Thank you.